Negotiating for a Community, Not an Individual, Tips from Ontario Disability Accessibility Advocacy. David Lepofsky, Chair, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. Delivered at the Osgoode Hall Law School, January 21st, 2014, as a Roy McMurtry Clinical Fellow. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is David Lepofsky. I'm speaking to you as Chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. We are a uh, non-profit, non-partisan, unincorporated volunteer coalition of people with, uh, with disabilities and people without disabilities and community organizations who've united to try to achieve a, a barrier-free province in the province of Ontario for all people with disabilities. Uh, I've had the privilege of serving uh, as first the co-chair and then the chair of its prior coalition called the Ontarians with Disabilities Act Committee from 1994 to 2005 when that coalition fought for and won the enactment of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act 2005. Um, and since 2009 I've had the privilege of serving as the chair of the successor coalition, the AODA Alliance, whose mandate is to try to get that 2005 statute effectively implemented. I'm not speaking in the capacity, I'm speaking in my personal capacity and not on behalf of the government where um, I am employed by day. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about this morning um, is not about the accessibility needs of people with disabilities or what we've won in legislation. I'm going to be giving, giving other lectures uh, on that uh, and not about the long political campaign to get that legislation implemented. So it's, it's a very interesting story and other lectures in this series will be available on that. This is a, a, a workshop or a seminar dealing with negotiations. And the negotiations you usually deal with are between individual parties and litigation. I want to talk to you about what happens when you take that experience and transpose it into the process of trying to negotiate for, for new legislation or regulations or policies. What I want to do is to first tell you just a little bit about the problem people with disabilities face that lead us to uh, want, led us to want new legislation and to explain what the legislation is that we won because any of the negotiations uh, content I talked to you about is anchored solely to that. Let's get right into it. The problem, the social problem is this. Um, we have a lot of people with disabilities in our community. They number over 1.7 or 1.8 million in Ontario, over 4 million across Canada. That's people with a physical or a sensory or a mental disability. Uh, I am blind, my, my disability is a sensory one or people with intellectual disabilities, learning disabilities, uh, mental health issues, and so on. And that number is growing because the, uh, the greatest cause of disability is aging, and our, our population is getting older. That number also understates the number of us because everybody eventually gets a disability at some point in their life, as long as you live long enough, or has someone near and dear to them who has a disability. Ultimately, we are the uh, minority of everyone. The problem that people with disabilities f face, continue to face, um, are barriers. Barriers that impede us from getting equal access to an education, to a job, to public services like transportation, uh, uh, to private products and goods. Uh, some of those barriers we face are physical, like steps to get into a building that impede someone in a wheelchair or a walker. Some of them are information barriers, like the uh, lack of uh, braille on an uh, elevator button. Some of them are communication barriers, the lack of sign language in a hospital uh, where needed in some cases. Some of the barriers we face are bureaucratic, some of them are legal, uh, some are attitudinal. All these barriers are illegal, they violate the Human Rights Code in Ontario or the Canadian Human Rights Act, depending whether the organization is in federal or, or provincial jurisdiction. And if it's a government agency, provincial, municipal, school board and so on, they also uh, violate the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which guarantees equality to people with disabilities without a discrimination based on physical or mental disability. The way they were, these uh, rights historically were enforced is by individuals filing individual complaints. Either a complaint under the Human Rights Code or a lawsuit under the Charter of Rights. You had to fight them one individual at a time, one barrier at a time. Most people with disabilities don't have the time, the money, and the wherewithal to fight those kind of battles. I know because I had to fight one against the Toronto, not one, but two, against the Toronto Transit Commission personally under the Human Rights Code, successfully uh, in the end to force them to audibly announce all bus and subway and streetcar stops. 
Um, this led a number of us in, in 1994 to decide we needed a new law that would get us to our goal of a barrier-free society without us having to litigate one barrier at a time. Um, we still wanted to retain our rights under the Human Rights Code and the Charter of Rights, but we want a law that made them a reality without us having to go through individual cases uh, wherever possible. That was the case for the Disabilities Act. We won it in 2005. The law that was passed was called the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, or AODA. Let me briefly summarize what it provides because that will give you a framework for everything I'm going to talk about in our next uh, minutes together. It requires Ontario to become fully accessible by 2025. By the way, it's the first equality-seeking law I've seen in Canada or indeed in North America or anywhere that set a goal like that with a fixed timeline. It requires the Ontario government to lead us there, not to itself remove and prevent every barrier, uh, but to develop, enact, and enforce separate regulations called accessibility standards with input from the disability community, the public and private sectors, to detail sector by sector what must be done and by when to achieve full accessibility. That's the legal background. Now let me jump into what becomes the subject of negotiation. What becomes the subject, there's several things. First, when we were campaigning for this law, uh, we were engaged in an extensive process of negotiating what the law would contain. We were first promised this legislation in 1995 by the Provincial Conservative Party under uh, Mike Harris as Premier. Uh, he was the first Premier who made such a promise. And we were involved in an effort to try to get them to keep that promise. In the end, in 2001, they passed a weak law, we thought it was inadequate, called the Ontarians with Disabilities Act, or ODA, 2001. In 2003, when the Dalton McGuinty Liberals were enacted, they had promised that they would make it pass a stronger law. And from 2003 to 2005, we were involved in a, a detailed negotiation process to lead to the law itself. In another lecture in this series um, is a presentation on the discussions or how we designed the ingredients of this law. But I'm talking here today about the negotiation process. So one thing is just negotiating what's in the law. After the law was passed in 2005, uh, we've been involved in negotiations over what will be included in individual accessibility standards. In another lecture in this series, I'll talk about what we've won under those standards, but I want to talk here about the process of, of trying to get them. We're also involved in negotiations over their implementation. After a standard is enacted, the government will develop and release a policy guideline or other uh, tools, educational supports, to help obligated organizations know what they got to do. And we can be involved in negotiating what those contain as well. And finally, we can be involved in other kinds of negotiations over collateral issues beyond the substantive content of the law in the standards, over how it's enforced, over what activities the government's doing on other fronts to achieve accessibility beyond simply de developing, enacting, and enforcing accessibility standards. So there's a wide range of things that can become the subject of negotiation. So, um, what's odd about doing this? I could tell you from my perspective as chair of my coalition and as someone who is also a lawyer, there are several things that are odd or different compared to what you learn in this seminar about mediating or negotiating settlements of individual pieces of litigation between individual parties. The first is, I'm not playing lawyer. I am not the lawyer for my coalition. I am the chair, I'm the leader or spokesperson. And so I, I'm stepping, I'm drawing on what I've learned throughout my life, including of course through my legal education and my work as a lawyer, on how one negotiates. But on actual legal issues, we get our proposals lawyered. Because uh, I, I'm not representing myself or holding myself out to be um, my coalition's lawyer. Uh, the second thing that's unusual is that in a, in a conventional piece of mediation, there are clients, and if they have a lawyer, there's a specific client who can instruct. 
our coalition is unusual because we have a wide number of supporters, but we do everything in an informal way. Um, and I'm going to talk to you in a minute about how we do it. But it is not the kind of thing like a private corporation or individual where somebody is in control, someone is the directing mind, and they have uh, uh, the authority to uh, go through whatever internal processes you have to to figure out what their position is. With us, it's much more amorphous. I'm going to tell you how we do that in a minute, in a couple of minutes. Um, the next thing that's unusual is that when you're doing mediation in the context of a lawsuit, um, uh, there's typically a court or a tribunal that can step in and decide the case if the mediation fails. In our case, there isn't. We are negotiating with the government who will talk to all sorts of others as well to decide what they're going to do, but we don't have recourse to any particular body to order them to do anything uh, if we don't succeed. Um, and finally, this process is not governed by a governing piece of uh, legislation or a law. Of course, the standards and the measures should comply with the Human Rights Code, and we can argue, and the Charter of Rights, and if they are, fall short, we could point that out. Uh, but but um, the government has the power under the Disabilities Act to make accessibility standards that are weaker than the requirements of the Human Rights Code and the Charter, or stronger. We have a safeguard in the legislation that if they pass a standard that is weaker than the requirements of the Human Rights Code, it doesn't relieve an obligated organization for complying with the Human Rights Code. Um, so we always retain our rights. But that alone, that, that, that's a safety net for us. But we, uh, it's clear that we can't force them to pass a standard that's stronger than uh, um, than, they, than they want to. The only recourse we have beyond that is, of course, the political process, which we use, though we are nonpartisan. In the end, in a piece of negotiation or mediation, you can end up with a settlement agreement that is binding and enforceable. Of course, in the public, uh, pardon me, in the social justice advocacy world, there is no such thing. Um, there is uh, at most, we can say, if they propose something, we can say, hey, if you do that, we'll cheer. Or if you do that, we will criticize and complain. We can encourage people to support what the government's done, or we can encourage people to oppose what the government's done. But beyond that, it's a negotiation process without the same notion at the end where you sign a binding settlement agreement as you would in a, in a, in a case. So how do we do it? Let me talk to you about the practicalities of how we do it, and then what I'd like to conclude with is some of what, what I've learned. Well, for each issue, we've evolved. Uh, uh, there, there, the first step is we have to figure out who has the final say. And in government, that's not always easy. Um, it's not easy because it depends on, uh, on the way, it, it, because there may be uh, more than one cabinet minister involved. There may be more than one department of the government involved. The government, and also within any of those uh, organizations, a ministry or, or, or a department of the government, um, there is the person who is on paper described as the person in charge. But you may find out that, in fact, the shots are being called from somewhere else. So there's a lot of work to be done to figure out who you should negotiate with. In contrast, when mediation is done between a husband and a wife in a divorce situation, <laughs> it's the negotiations between the husband and the wife, right? I mean, that, those are who you talk to. Uh, they each know who they have to ultimately resolve with. Excuse me. What we then do is we try to figure out what our position is going to be. And we do this by, through um, email, and Twitter, and Facebook, and other means, public forums at times, or, or informal discussions, we will ask our community for input. When we were coming forward with our proposals for the legislation back in the 90s, we held public forums all around the province to get input from people and collect ideas. Um, but some kind of give us your feedback is part of the process. 
Then what we now will do, or in recent years will do, is we will develop a draft brief or draft proposal for what we want. And we'll make it public. If you look at our website, our current website, aodaalliance.org, or our predecessor coalition's website, odacommittee.net, you will see a number of times they'll say, please come give us your feedback on this draft brief. Now, I want to openly tell you, this is weird. Normally, organizations will draft, put together a proposal privately and secretly, and they'll have back and forth. To go, and they only want to go public with the finished product. We don't. We, our laundry is out there before it's washed for all to see. And we've found this to be a tremendously constructive process because um, in a, a, a coalition that has supporters all around the province, uh, where we have no capacity to bring them all into one room and, uh, and conduct a, um, an electronic or a balloted vote, um, we need uh, to give people an opportunity to read, review, and give us our ideas. And we get tremendous ideas from people, uh, 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 people with advanced degrees in subjects that we're dealing with, people with uh, no degree at all and no university training, but a whole heck of a lot of good ideas. We've found that ideas win or lose on their own merits, not based on the, the credentials of the person offering them. So we get th that input, and it's interesting because the government will see our draft brief the same time our community will. We have no secrets in that regard. Then we get feedback, and then we try to incorporate it into a final brief, and then we circulate it, and we make it public. Now, my coalition is not, the, is not like a trade union that's the exclusive bargaining agent that, that the government must listen to and no one else. Um, we know that ultimately our arguments must be persuasive to the government, but they got to be persuasive to our own community. So when we write our briefs, we try to do it in a way that is persuasive, that makes the case to anyone reading it. A politician, a public servant, a member of our community, a journalist. Um, and, and then we will take that brief and we will make our pitch. There may be formal avenues for negotiation, like uh, for presenting your case, like standing committees of a legislature, if it's a bill before the legislature or public formal consultation meetings that the government convenes if it's developing an accessibility standard. But a lot of the negotiations will go on through informal meetings with public servants at uh, the front lines doing policy work, with deputy ministers, assistant deputy ministers, with cabinet ministers, and even with the premier's office. Uh, and it's an ongoing exercise in persuasion. So what have I learned and what has my coalition learned in terms of uh, how to do this. We're always learning. Uh, we're always learning. Uh, and it's a tremendous opportunity to keep trying things out uh, and, um, and, uh, and, going f and, and improving as you go. Well, what have we learned? First thing that we've learned um, is you can't please everybody. So your best bet is not to go for unanimity, it's to go for harmony. There's always going to be someone out there who doesn't like what we propose. And that's fine, that's good, that's democracy. What we've learned is that we, uh, we should be ambitious, but practical. Um, if I can draw on, um, for those of you who are um, enamored with getting to yes uh, by Fisher and the Harvard Mediation Project, uh, the old way of thinking this would be we should go and ask for everything. We should ask for every building to be torn down tomorrow and rebuilt the next day to be fully accessible and then the government will come back and offer us nothing and let's see if we can draw a line somewhere. And the more we demand, uh, the more we'll get when there's a compromise. Of course, all of you, if you've been involved in learning about negotiations anywhere since well, the early 1980s when the Harvard Negotiation Project or Mediation Project figured out that that's not such a clever thing, we've learned that, that kind of positional bargaining is not a good idea. Yes, we should be ambitious, but we've got to ask for what's realistic and doable. Our ideas should be appealing not only to the disability community, but to the business community. Uh, they should not only appeal to the public sector, who have to implement them, but to taxpayers who have got to pay for them. And so we try to get input from those other areas, formally or informally. We're always uh, happy to get that kind of feedback so that we can make sure that we anticipate uh, concerns that others will have and, we and, and take them into account. 
We use an interesting yardstick when we put forward a proposal. We want our proposals to be the kind that when you read them, you're going to go, why the heck not? Or, why are you asking for more? Now, that's not to say we're selling us short, but we want them to be so inherently attractive that people uh, on the other side of the table will not uh, be in a position to say, we can't tear down every building in Tomorrow, you're crazy. Um, but rather to turn around by saying, look, this is completely doable. Not only is this doable, but we could be asking for more. We're being reasonable. Um, the uh, other things that we've learned about is that uh, mediation or negotiating, I should say, in this context, involves resort to different um, um, uh, potential supports if you're not getting anywhere. In the litigation process, the mediation breaks down, you always say, look, we can't agree, you're not going the way I want to go, let's go to court. A judge will do better for us, or a tribunal uh, will do better for us. What we've come to learn is, of course, because we don't have that, we've got to have access to uh, backup to strengthen our case if mere persuasion isn't working. Well, that includes, A, reaching out to individual members of the legislature. You will see, if you follow us on Twitter or read our emails, by the way, if someone watching this video wants to sign up for our Twitter feed, my personal one is at David Lepofsky, L-E-P-O-F-S-K-Y, and my coalition's is at AODA Alliance. And an email request to get our emails can be sent to aodafeedback at gmail.com. But in any event, um, we will encourage people to go out there and individually advocate to uh, individual members of the legislature. If we can't get anywhere with a cabinet minister, we want to put heat on within the cabinet and within the caucus. We will appeal to the public. You'll see we've had a number of guest columns in newspapers or media articles on our issues. Um, and uh, uh, we've had a number of editorials support us uh, and, and specific things that we've, we've pressed for. And those are part of the pressure dynamic or the persuasion dynamic that works in the political process. We will approach opposition parties. We, we actually are nonpartisan and therefore we'll talk to all parties. And if we're in a position to go to the government by saying, look, if you do X, both opposition parties agree, so they're going to hammer you if you don't. And if you do, they're not going to be slamming you. You don't have to worry if you do X that they're going to be out campaigning against you because you did X. So for us, it's, it's very important to work with and gain support of opposition parties. There are times we use formal processes, if we can, getting a question asked and question period by an opposition uh, member of the uh, legislature to put public attention on something, and that can uh, trigger action. And the other avenue we have is our own community. Well, I'm, 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 I'm pleased and delighted that the hard work of my coalition from one end of the province to the other has won a lot of credibility and respect at the legislature and at Queen's Park and within uh, the journalistic community. We're not everybody. So when we put out a brief, we, we encourage people to not only like it, but to write the government to, to endorse it. And we'll say, and, and, and what we will press for is public consultations to create a forum where others can come forward and uh, raise their views. Now, if they don't agree with us, that's fine, that's democracy, but if they do, it provides a platform to show this isn't just one coalition, that our voice is, is a louder one and, a more, it, and it covers a broader spectrum. So those are just some of the tools which you can bring to bear because you're not in a position to say, hey, if you don't do X, um, I, yeah, I, I'm, uh, this mediation's over and I'm off to, uh, I'm off to court uh, and a judge is going to make you do X. Um, it's been a tremendous, uh, let me conclude by telling you this. Um, I have constantly been um, heartened, um, honored, and delighted by the tremendous feedback we've gotten on our briefs by the great ideas we get from people and from the number of people who will pick up on our ideas and carry them forward and add their own. Um, I'm, and, uh, and in the end, uh, while in a lecture I'm going to give on February 3rd, I'll be documenting that there's a long way we've got to go and we're behind schedule for achieving full accessibility. These strategies, I believe, have been helpful in moving us considerably further ahead uh, than the disability community would have been 
um, had we uh, not undertaken these strategies uh, over all of these uh, 20 years. Let me conclude this uh, part of my presentation.